tell us about some, uh, cause you, you are at the collective genius right now. Tell us some of the, the takeaways or some of the stuff that you've learned or the interesting insights that you've gained since you've been there. Cause you've been there all week. Yeah. I, I got here Sunday night and they, they start off on, on Monday. Uh, what we do is we spend, uh, seven hours and we had, uh, five breakout rooms. That's how many folks we have now. So we had five rooms, half the room had to give a 20 minute presentation, uh, about, you know, either their, you know, what's going on in their business or something new, uh, or just something they wanted to share. And what, what stuck out, um, the most with me in my breakout room was Paul Moore. Uh, if you guys don't know Paul Moore, he runs a, a fund that is, uh, mainly multifamily and self storage. Uh, they have about a, uh, 70, $80 million fund. And his talk was on the professional investor, the investor who has money and and their view is I have money. I want to make sure I keep it. Principle and, preservation. Yeah. Yes. And so the, the topic or the, the title of his um, presentation was the boring investor. And they're happy with five, six, seven, eight percent. If you present them with a 11, 12 percent return, they're thinking, you know, well, this investment is just way too risky too risky yeah i mean i've had that exact conversation with someone you know you mentioned like a you know a high number and it's like ooh, that sounds dangerous yeah. right well you have to dig into the numbers there there are ways to get uh high returns and still be relatively safe for, for example if uh, you're in a fund that allows you to compound over time while the uh, initial investment or the the quarterly returns uh, are, are going to be, you know, in the single digits over time, as you can compound the, that, those balances, uh, you can certainly get a much, much higher uh, rate of return. But the vast majority of, the, of funds, especially the ones that hold property, uh, they don't tend to uh, compound your returns. They're paying you out uh, income. Yes. Well, they can't, they can't compound if they're holding, or they can, but it's un unlikely because they have to maintain a certain cash flow and liquidity level. Right. Right. Yeah. So it, it's very difficult for that. But, but I like the, the premise that um, the, the more money that you have, uh, the less you're chasing yield. Uh, now that's not going to help someone who's a little behind on the um, retirement uh, build up. Sure. And there's a lot of those people that are behind from 2008. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. if you've lost a lot uh, during that time, you're still trying to catch up. And then again, at the same time, if you're fairly young, uh, it's okay to have a certain part of your portfolio that's risky because mm -hmm. you can make up for it. You still have time. So he was talking about these, you know, these, was he talking about how to target them or what did that like? What, what no, was he was ma mainly talking uh, about, uh, how they, and yeah, I guess it does have to do a little bit with targeting, uh, as far as the marketing piece and, mm -hmm. and letting, letting us know, cause most of us in the room are trying to raise capital for, you know, our real estate businesses. And, uh, he's just letting you know out there, if you, uh, there's a certain segment of the population that, uh, if you give them all these high numbers, they're, they're going to think, uh, your investment is too risky. Sure. Uh, so there's a different way to uh, market to those folks. Yeah, um, you have you have growth and then you have preservation. I mean, those are two completely different people. Yeah. Well, you know, they're very high caliber people in, in the room. And the vast majority of the presentations were we've done very well. How do I minimize my taxes now? <laughs> so, we've done very well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, it's been a really good market. Yes. Um, but great markets uh, always end up having poor markets in the future. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, always. Uh, I know you hate always. Um, typically, 
Um, <laughs> you're going to have a downturn in the market coming at some point because yeah. all markets are secular and we, we are secular, 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 secular. Yeah. We're, you know, we've, we've been on a, a long real estate run, but I can tell you right now, uh, there's still a, a housing shortage. People mm. still need a place to live. So it, it's going to continue for a little while. And I was touching this on our last show. There's a heck of a lot more competition out there now because the institutional investors, they're looking for yield and, uh, they are tearing it up out here, buying houses right and left. And by the way, they don't care about buying a house for more than it's worth right now because they're looking five to seven years down the road. And that thing is going to continue to give them income and it's going to go up in value. Yep. Absolutely. So uh, I'm not saying this to scare folks uh, in the, that are uh, mom and pops like the rest of us, but you just need to be aware of it and, you know, figure out ways to work with them and then leverage what it is that they're doing. You know, the, 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 the advice that I, you know, you know, prescribe for myself and, and I, I hand out to whoever asks for it is utilize them. Don't rely on them. Right. And that's, that's the difference. Um, utilize those, uh, those uh, people in the market or those institutions that are coming in um, to help um, create additional revenue streams for your company or for yourself or what have you, but don't pigeonhole yourself into relying on them to feed a machine that you're now creating or to be the, you know, your only capital source. That is a recipe for disaster. Ask anyone who's been in real estate for more than 10 years. Yeah. Now, here's another thing uh, that, uh, along those same lines. Uh, you need to diversify your uh, income streams as well. Uh, there was uh, some statistics that were quoted about uh, a couple of these uh, big home buyers, institutional home buyers. And oh, by the way, it, they, they buy in, in one name and then they have four or five other companies that they're buying in the, in those names, but they're all the same company mm -hmm. uh, they're buying in different entities, but they spent uh, in the, I think it was the month of November this one company spent $27 million in assignment fees. So they've, they're, <laughs> they're finding, they're, they're finding wholesalers to uh, find homes for them. And they spent mm -hmm. $27 million in a month in assignment fees. But there's another company called, Sundance uh, that's out there talking about how evil the wholesalers are and that, you know, we're the trusted alternative, blah, blah, blah. But they're doing, still doing the same thing. Yeah. They just got an $80 million infusion of cash on around the funding that they did through wall street. And do you think they could take $27 million of that and just use it for marketing instead of paying assignment fees? <laughs> Yeah, you, know, you know, yeah, they're they're trying to demonize the the wholesaler, um, and you know, just like every other industry, there are a few bad eggs for sure. But all in all, the majority of wholesalers that we've worked with or that we know are, you know, very stand up, very reputable. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, 